I'd like to start up um, by welcoming, welcoming up Ashley Krongold, founding venture partner with the global crowdfunding platform Our Crowd, based out of Israel. Uh, now, Dan Bennett was supposed to be joining us to present, but um, unfortunately couldn't make it at the last minute. So, Ashley has very kindly crossed the ditch to be with us. Ashley's passionate about the democratisation of venture capital that crowdfunding facilitates and will lead the discussion on this, in this session on equity crowdfunding. I'll hand over to Ashley now to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Lou. Um, I'd like to call up to the stage uh, Josh Daniel from Snowball Effect and David Wallace from Crowdcube. We're going to do this session together and it's going to be a very open discussion where we want lots of dialogue. Um, Firstly, thank you for having me in New Zealand. It's actually my first time in New Zealand. I travel everywhere around the world and as I always say to my wife and my kids, you've got to get to New Zealand. Everyone says it's, it, it's beautiful and every time the holiday comes around, we say, no, we'll just go to the beach and, and go somewhere else. And I'm going to bring back, because when I flew into Christchurch, it was uh, into Queensland, it was just absolutely stunning. So um, we'll be back here next year. Crowdfunding, it's an, it's an interesting term which over the last uh, 24 hours since I've been here, I've realised there's actually a little bit of a stench to the word crowdfunding in New Zealand. Um, whereas in Australia, there isn't. And I thought we were very similar in, in we are similar in so many regards. Um, I think that what we're going to do in this session, we're going to nullify the word and the term crowdfunding. I think it's, uh, let's, let's talk more about how our businesses are today financing startups, Series A, Series B, and, venture, and, and businesses that are looking to get equity in them and how we're financing them. There's a whole range that we can talk about. Just a little bit on, on our crowd and uh, why I'm here representing. So, I was in, prior to running my family group, I was in investment banking for 15 years and was very heavily involved in the capital raisings for a wide range of companies globally. Um, I always thought it was quite an arduous task. You had to go to family groups predominantly and you were looking, uh, a lot of our clients were looking to raise 10, 20 million dollars into the businesses uh, you could go, either go via stockbroking or you, to a stockbroker and raise it via an IPO, or you could go to a private group of investors and raise it that way. We did the latter, and you'd have to go to clients and ask for a million dollars a pop. And it was, it was arduous. You had, to, you had to do a lot of due diligence, you had to give a lot of explanation, and it took a long time to raise the funds. I was then introduced to a, a guy uh, by the name of John Medved in Israel. I travel to Israel probably three times a year. Um, and Israel being a real incubator of ideas, I have a lot of other businesses in Israel. And um, in the times that myself and my father and my family before, before that were going to Israel and speaking to professors, just hearing their ideas and taking them, and what we would do is we would take those ideas and we'd commercialise it. We'd grab it, we'd licence it, I'd say, give me the licence for America, give me the licence for Asia, thanks very much, and, and gone. Israel very quickly, uh, 10, 15 years ago, realised the, 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 the founders, these jockeys that we were talking about this morning, um, f the founders of these businesses and these technologies were saying, enough of that, we want to commercialise, we want to be part of it, so you can't have it. And we'd say, oh, OK, well, then give us 50%. They say, fine, but I'm the MD. And, and so I said, well, that was where I was going to stop and I was going to concentrate on my other businesses until I met John. And I was introduced to John by another founding partner in the GP of our crowd called uh, uh, Jeff Levy. And he introduced me to John and I, I went and met with John and what he said absolutely resonated with me. And he said, this is, we, all do, we do the due diligence, Ash, but I've got to tell you, there's something that's just occurred, and it was a device produced by Oculus Rift, which I'm sure quite a lot of you know here, is a virtual reality headset um, that was invented, and they went to Kickstarter. Kickstarter raised them a nice round of money from 
crowd, a crowd of investors around the world, and subsequently that company, company Oculus Rift, then went and did another raising, and then they went and um, sold it to Facebook for $2 billion. Um, and John said to me, the initial angels who invested in this business got a T-shirt. John said they got a T-shirt. And he said, oh, we're going to do it differently at our crowd. What we're going to do is we're going to be equity crowd funders. We're going to allow anyone who is the first investor to be the shareholder of this business together with us as a, as a GP. And we will invest together, and that's how we'll do it. And we'll all make money. And whoever invests first is, should, by right, make the most money. And that's where our crowd started. Today, and call it three years later, our crowd is, we've done circa this year alone, $220 million of raisings into businesses. We've now invested in over 80 businesses. And what I want to talk this discussion about is I want to take this discussion to more, not about crowdfunding, but more about collaboration. Because a lot of these terms have been used uh, today, collaboration, and, um, and I think what we do well is we take the best of all forms of financing and we combine it together. And I think Josh and David will hopefully agree with me and I'd like to hear what they do. Um, Josh is running a business snowball effect and it's based in New Zealand. I see a lot of our crowd in Josh's business. Um, Josh has, with his business, is predominantly based in New Zealand and our crowd is obviously now global. We, we have over 10,000 approved investors worldwide. We um, have invested, as I said, in 80 odd businesses um, and we're in 120 countries. We've got 80 people worldwide now that are um, working for our crowd. We do an enormous amount of due diligence and what we, what we look to do and what we, we seek in, in our partners are a range and it's not just going to a crowd and saying give us money and we're going to take that and let's see how it goes. So we are a combination between, at times we're venture capitalists, at times we're angels, at times we're a combination of the two. We do it via a range of crowd sourcing. So at times we will go and invest in a business and say it needs a round of angel or it needs a round of, of um, reward-based crowdfunding before it gets to a final round of crowdfunding. We have today, we partner up with um, a range of corporate partners. So we have together our corporate partners and co-investors of companies like GE, like Microsoft, 3M, etc. Um, and the way we look at uh, today, what happens with when we're raising money for uh, um, equity to go into a business, for example, the most recent one, which was a company called Emprest. This company had done $25 million in its first year and of revenue and $7 million of profit. A great business. It was invented by the founders of who invented the Iron Dome. I don't know if you guys know, but Israel have a, um, a technology that they use to prevent missiles coming over and, and hitting Israel's land, and that is, it uh, was invented by two guys who have today um, taken that technology and um, put it in and worked out a way to identify power surges and, and how to redirect power within uh, large buildings in New York City, for example, where they're taking it. So they needed $25 million to get to the next stage. We went to our corporate partners. We had GE invest $10 million into, the, into that deal. Then we went to our angel investors. And then we went to our crowd funders at the same time, to our crowd around the world, and we raised that remaining $15 million in a couple of weeks. And it was a really good example of collaboration. Um, another example, before I get to include Josh into, and David into the discussion, is SIO. So um, after, after John saw that uh, Oculus Rift example, these guys came up with um, a product, which was a consumer product, which basically is a, a laser beam that you 
beam into any type of uh, organic substance and it tells you the, um, the makeup of, that, of what it is, how many calories, if it's an apple, what is it, it it's an apple, if it's a, a glass of alcohol and it directs it directly to your mobile phone that someone's dropped a roofie in it because it's, uh, it's got a drug in it that shouldn't be there, what type of grape is it, etc. Anything organic. They got their idea from Dr Spock and Gene Roddenberry invented Star Trek who invented the tricorder. The way we funded it was that we, we seeded it with, with $375,000 that we raised from angels and from our crowd. We then believed that the next stage was to go to Kickstarter and get it out to the market, of which Kickstarter did, and we raised $1.2 million. Then it came back to us and we did a follow-on stage and raised 3.3 .3 in two weeks, and away it was. So we, use, we, we liked the collaboration model. We then said we want partners around the world, we want investors around the world, and we want strategic investors around the world. And why we do that is because the more that we can integrate, the more that we can collaborate with each other, you find that you get more expertise in and access to expertise to offer to, you, you, to the, co the corporates and the businesses and the companies that you're dealing with. So a lot of our crowd we go to. We know that some of them have expertises in all fields and we might go to them and say, in this case, you've had um, an understanding of the organic industry. Could you please come and sit on this board? So it's about collaborating and all those people are from all countries around the world. So I might just bring Josh into it and David um, to give a, a bit more understanding of, I want to get an understanding, why is crowdfunding considered why does it have a bit of a, a stench at the moment in New Zealand? Um, and what are you seeing in companies like our crowd that you may like to emulate or where you, you think we're on the wrong track? So uh, I guess a bit of a brief on what's happened with equity crowdfunding in New Zealand. It's been going for 14 months. There's been $13.8 million raised. Uh, I can speak in a bit more detail about the data that goes through our platform where the average deal size, deal size is just over a million dollars. Um, who's investing? Um, average age is 45, mostly guys, um, and all over New Zealand. And the average investment size is about 4.5k. In terms of how we see the collaboration working and where there is some crossover between angel groups and equity crowdfunding, I think there's three key ways in which we can collaborate between the two groups. And these are exactly the same three, three things as I talked about last year. It's referrals, co-investment, and growing new angels. So the first one is referrals. And this is really looking at the types of deals that are best suited to angel investors and the types of deals that are best suited to equity crowdfunding. And it's really looking at the value that comes alongside the cash. And we all know what that is for angel investors. For equity crowdfunding, it's really about the broad exposure and the efficient way to top up a round or to fill out a round. Um, so the first one is referrals. We've had a number of examples in those 40 months where we've made referrals to angel investors or other private investors if we think that's the best fit, and a number of examples where deals have been referred to us either, either as a top up round or where they just think that this is best suited to a public offer. Second thing is co-investment, and this is the sort of scenario where it already has some angel backing or backing of private investors, and essentially looking at a way to efficiently top up that round. And we've seen a number of examples of this in the market so far. Um, it would be unlikely for a deal to go out on our platform anyway without some sort of credible lead investor. So this is a model which is happening in New Zealand already. And the third is growing new angels, and we think that there's a real opportunity for the formal angel groups um, to grow their membership through what's happening in equity crowdfunding. And the idea is that no one is born as an angel investor, we all learn about it through exposure, and this is a way to get exposure, and you can diversify 10 grand pretty easily, whereas obviously the bite sizes with angel investing are typically larger. So this is um, a way that there's now 8,500 people on our list anyway that are getting exposure to investing in early stage businesses, a chance for them to learn about the process and get involved in the community. So it's through that exposure that we think new angels will grow and form angel groups um, over the longer run. Me? Right. Um, I've been so busy watching the screen I've forgotten what I was going to say, but that's all right. Um, so for those that know me, half of my day job is running an investment bank at Millery Private Capital. 
Um, we followed quite closely and were quite active in the, in the um, process of the development of the Financial Markets Conduct Act um, and saw obviously crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending thrown in at the end, which kind of intrigued us after we'd done the, um, done the select committee presentations. Um, I guess our approach um, with Crowdcube was why would we build a platform, let's go and find someone big in the world and do a joint venture with them, so we approached the guys at Crowdcube in the UK and did that. I think the, the, the big thing from our point of view was it's, this is all about distribution, right? Um, I hate the name crowdfunding. Um, you know, churches have been fantastic at doing crowdfunding since the day dot. Uh, an IPO is a crowdfunding round. Angel investing is crowdfunding in a form, right? All we're doing is putting uh, uh, offers up on a platform um, and pushing those offers out to more of the public than um, would otherwise be the case with, um, with uh, groups of angels. I think the nice thing from our perspective um, as an investment bank, we're pretty agnostic to how we fund transactions. Um, you know, we haven't gone into setting up the crowdfunding platform to build a business out of it. I actually think crowdfunding businesses are fundamentally flawed and most of them will go broke. Hopefully not you guys, but that's the reality of the thing. And if you look at these businesses worldwide, they are adding so many people because they're, re they're now realising there is so much work in reviewing offers and getting companies in the right space uh, and getting them up to speed that their costs are actually running a hell of a lot faster than um, the revenue they're bringing in the top line. So it's kind of going to be really interesting over the next few years watching how um, the crowdfunding platforms actually stay together and stay upright. Um, I think that's, that's something that um, everyone wants to, uh, everyone needs to be um, quite conscious of. So as I was saying, you know, we actually don't care how we raise the money for our companies that, that we bring through the investment bank. Um, it's really sitting there and going, what is best for this company? What's going to work for them? Where are they at in their, in their life cycle? You know, is it a crowd round on a Kickstarter or a Pledge Me? Um, is it a angel investment uh, round, which we've done a few with you guys? Um, is it a round that we should actually send to Josh or send to Anna at Pledge Me or keep for ourselves? Um, or are we actually going to take these guys down the road of a, of a, of a regulated offer? Um, it's about from um, selecting the right thing for the companies. Yeah, and, and I think, David, just on that, when you mention that you don't mind where the funding comes from, I think we're, we're in a similar vein. We, we pick and choose. There are so many different ways you can finance a business today that it's not just, we don't just do crowdfunding. And, all our companies are looking at the same at different points, as I mentioned earlier. You'd want an angel invest. This is perfect for angel investment. This is perfect for a combination of reward-based uh, crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, and maybe angel investment altogether. I think one thing, though, that with crowdfunding is there are a lot of businesses around the world that just because they've got the crowd, they just pump, out, pump it out there and that's it. The crowd don't really know what they're getting. At companies like our crowd, what we do is, I mean, we're actually, within Israel, we're considered the nerds of Israel um, because the amount of due diligence that we do to make sure that something gets through our filter, look, we, we look at about 300 odd businesses a month now and maybe one or two or two or three get through all the filters that's required before we look at what type of funding and how we're gonna, how we're gonna fund those businesses. So we don't say because we're gonna use we don't put the cart before the horse. Um, and the other thing is with regards to do we back the jockeys, do you back the, do you back the, uh, um, the horse? I think at times, like, like it was mentioned earlier, I think it was Eric from Sri Lanka might have mentioned that at times you back the jockeys and at times you back the horse, and we're the same. Um, there are lots of our businesses that we look at, we think it's wonderful, and at the point of we're ready to invest, we say, look, we're happy to invest, but you're not the CEO, you're the wrong person. You're the inventor and you're the wrong person or the wrong group to take this forward. And we, we collaborate with our partners who are in there 
to make sure that it's the right business going forward. So I don't think crowdfunding is just putting it out there. I think a lot of crowd funders are giving potentially a bad name. But um, it's certainly just another form, as, as David mentioned, it's been around for a long time. It's just another tool in the box of funding a business. Yep. I could add oh, a little yeah, yeah. New Zealand flavour onto um, the jockey or horse. Um, we find it difficult at this stage of the market to back the jockey. And the, the key reason is that with online investing, you don't have the opportunity to sit down with the founding team really get a sense of their passion, of their resilience, of their ability to execute. You're doing this all online. And so where we think equity crowdfunding fits in well in the New Zealand context at this early stage of the market is really growth capital. It's where the company has some runs on the board. That traction is visible in terms of sales through an online um, brief. And there's a whole lot of other reasons why we think that stage of company is more suitable to public offers. One is that they're more likely to have non-executive um, directors on the board. They're more likely to have been through funding rounds before, know what it's like to have a whole bunch of new shareholders. They're more likely to have a bigger audience to market the offer to. They're more likely to be clear about their strategy. And remember, there is still risk involved with the public offer. If you're making false, misleading, unsubstantiated statements, you're out there um, with personal risk. And so if a company's a bit further down the track, clearer about their strategy, clearer about what they're going to use the funds for, and it's easier for them to have the confidence to go out and make a public offer. So where we see the market at in New Zealand is that equity crowdfunding fits well for growth capital. And earlier stage capital might work, but it's going to need um, a whole lot of those other hygiene factors which often aren't there at the very early stage. So, so, so just Josh, I actually might um, have an opposing view on that, if it's okay. Sure. Um, as an example, if you look on the screen, there's a company here called Next Pair. There, there, there are times when we look at the jockey and we say, uh, maybe this business ain't going to make be worth ten billion dollars in ten years' time. What, what are, what's your motivation? Show us what you're doing. And this kid was about 16 years old. He was introduced not through our crowd, just through someone who knew him. Um, who would, worked in the our crowd business and just said, look, he's a kid at home and he plays, game, he plays online games, but, um, but they're just apps. And what he, de he was a really smart boy and what he de de um, designed was he was able to put together a way that you can take an online app and get other users in the world, all kids around the world, to be online and be as a multiplayer game. He, he managed to create that within six months. Within one year, he'd sold the business to Varingo for $10 million and made himself $10 million effectively because our crowd just backed him with a very small amount and it wasn't through our business, it was just through an angel. Um, he then, he's now, that, that platform has 1.5 million new users per day on it. So, so sometimes we look at it and we say, it might not fit this box, but it fits a whole range of boxes. And Jayesh meant, mentioned it earlier. He said, I like the guys under 30. I like the people under 30, the girls and boys who are create, who've just got ideas. And then someone else mentioned, I like them over 30, right? Because then they're more down the track and more experienced and there's a lot more to like about the business and, they're, they're, and you've got better board members and executive. And I think it's, it can be a mix of everything. I think we're so lucky that we are a global market now that, that what we can do is take the best of everything and, and work out what fits for that founder with that company at this time. Financing, financing is the easy part. Really, it is. That's the easy part. We've got so many tools now. The old days, you just had private equity. You'd go to private equity or, as David said, you'd go to an IPO and crowdfund it that way. Um, the finance is easy. You've just got to have the right idea. And, and if you miss out on some of those kids who are, who are 15 years old and never want to do it again, they've got no interest in being a, a founder or an executive, they don't want to go on with it. They just want to play their games. They can, you can make them a lot of money and make your investors a lot of money along the way. Okay, so, so 
Um, I think what I want to do is open up the floor and it's not about questions, but just tell us things that you... Uh, again, I got the sense that New Zealand... Can I say something? Yeah, go for it, David. Um, I think, um, just kind of reflecting back, one of, one of the key things that uh, is starting to exercise our minds not just you know how do we work uh, closely with you guys and how do we work with the institutional investors um, you know there is a still a lot of weariness towards um, the whole crowdfunding concept um, and that's going to take time to fill this through um, we actually think the extension of all this is going to start to get really interesting and, and and I think we're starting to see some of the issues arise in New Zealand is you know is two million dollars enough uh, should it be three? Should it be five? Um, jury's out on that for a wee while, um, but I think in a few years' time we are, we are going to get the opportunity to, to review that. Um, but coming back to some of the comments I think Nelson was making earlier about cross-border investing, um, you know, I think globally we are going to have, as an industry, both crowdfunding and obviously angel investing, is our regulatory environments around the world just are not keeping up with the technology in terms of flows of capital um, and requirements for you know someone sitting in New Zealand wanting to invest you know in, in something on our crowd somewhere else in the world or in the US um, how do all those protections protections work if there are any um, and I think this is this is the part of the market where um, the regulators are going to find themselves really struggling and it's probably going to put a handbrake on the industry as a whole. Um, I, think, I think the other thing, uh, if we can open, and I said I do want to open the floor, but one of the things that I've found is you've got to, and at our crowd, you've got to have a simple value proposition. If, if you're dealing with these businesses, and when I say simple value proposition, it doesn't mean that you can't have really good technology that you... You, that you don't understand at the time, but the whole value proposition, in our opinion, it's we like we prefer the technologies and the companies that are, are going to change the world. So, as an example, Rewalk, and and I've put it up there for this specific reason: simple value proposition. This was a guy who was a, um, and that's him there. He, um, he he actually wasn't walking because he's a quadriplegic and he can't. But he, he was in a car accident, he was a scientist, and he said, I want, I'm going to walk again. And he invented a technology that allows paraplegics to walk, and that's as simple as it is. His technology makes paraplegics walk, people who've never walked. A girl who did the Boston Marathon, uh, sorry, the New York Marathon, she'd never walked, she did the whole marathon in rewalk. It, then we took it, when listed on, on the NASDAQ, and um, people around the world uh, have got this technology. He's now gone and said, I'm not stopping there. I'm going to go and um, I'm going to walk one day. So in the meantime, he went and invented another thing called Up and Ride, which is it, it, it's effectively a segue for people confined to wheelchairs. So it lifts them up um, so they can make a cup of tea. It allows them to go down the street and stand up at the same height as as everyone else, um, and it changes their world in the meantime. Simple value propositions that do well, that people gravitate to. So I just thought I'd, I'd raise that, because I think it's really important that um, we're seeing so many every day, but which ones are going to change the world? Which ones are going to have a genuine effect on people? On top of that, what I wanted to mention is that being global, we've now, um, we did our first deal with uh, a New Zealand-based company called CropEx, which I'm sure, or hopefully a lot of you have heard of, um, which enables farmers to control the water use that they're, they're doing and saving them a fortune of money. And it's really important. Now, that technology has come straight from New Zealand. And if there's one thing that a, a lot of people say, well, Israel, why, why is Israel at the moment at such a, at a forefront of technology and this and this area in the world. And I'll tell you why. I mean, just putting it into perspective, Israel is, uh, it would be about eight times smaller in landmass than the South Island of New Zealand and has seven million people. 
So it's not too different to New Zealand in land mass and, and people, but it's well ahead because they said enough of us just selling our technology and the rest of the world doing, um, taking it up, we're going to keep the technology and we're happy to sell you our product. And that's what I think New Zealand will get to and Australia needs to get to. Australians, New Zealanders, we're so good at technology, at finding and inventing things, but I don't think over the years we've trusted ourselves to take it, to be at the forefront of it, and we've sold it off. Um, and I think we're just starting to learn that. Israel learnt that a long time ago. And for that reason, they have, you know, the second most companies listed on the NASDAQ of any country in the world. So it's um, the collaboration that Israel and New Zealand, Israel and Australia are doing in the field of agriculture. Um, you guys invented this water technology. Israel invented hydroponics. Australia's invented ways to, um, uh, on um, how, to, how to better grow agriculture in such a dry um, environment. We've learnt that from Israel. We're selling, you know, we're learning, we're, you're so fertile, we're, we're getting a lot of information from you. Cross-border collaboration is really, really important. As for the financing of it, well, I think a few people mentioned it earlier, and I'll reiterate it, it's up to the country's laws, you know. If you're an individual, you've got to get over those laws. A lot of new laws are coming in. We in Australia have got now, obviously, anti-money laundering laws, We've got the know your client requirements. Um, everyone just needs to do them on their own and, and you won't get into the system unless you can pass it within your own country. So, Josh, how are you finding with uh, regards... How, how are you going to take your business? Because, as I mentioned to you earlier, I see, I see a lot of snowball effect in, in our crowd. I just see what you are today is where our crowd was based in Israel two and a half, three years ago. And today we're very global, and it's not because Israel's smarter or the people behind the company are, are smarter. I think it's because we, we made the decision that it's a global market. We're happy to tell everything to anyone. And, it, and, and I'll, I'd like to hear from you, how are you going to take um, Snowball Effect global? Because I don't think it can just stay in New Zealand. I think sure. you, you should take it global. How are you going to do it? So I agree with the points that have been made that there are regulatory barriers, particularly on the investor side of the market. The two major hurdles for us with bringing on international investment are anti-money laundering laws and the security laws of each country the investors are coming from. And anti-money laundering, you can deal with that. We have online processes to make that as slick as it can be. Securities law, if people don't comply or meet the criteria of an accredited investor for whatever country they're coming from, then they simply don't meet those laws and they can't invest. So our investor pool at the moment is limited to the New Zealand public and accredited investors from other countries around the world. From what we see so far, it is mostly New Zealand investors that are putting in the money. We do typically get one or two international investors on each deal. But in terms of taking it wider, um, yeah, absolutely, there are options arising in other countries and um, equity crowdfunding regulation is being passed in a number of countries around the world and the two markets which are pretty close um, that we're keeping an eye on are Australia and the US. Uh, but we certainly want to make an impact on our home market in New Zealand, um, but we still do have an eye on those international opportunities. Yeah. Well, I think you have made an impact in New Zealand, so congratulations. The, 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 the other thing is that where is crowdfunding and where is financing in this type of financing of, of startups and, and businesses looking for the second stage, third stage businesses, What's the next step? Well, obviously the next step is where can you create a secondary market? So you've now invested, you've been in for two years, you're in that cycle as an investor that it takes typically five odd years to, to realise anything and you need the money. How can you get out? That's where the problems start coming in. And I know that we, we're spending a lot of time working on the secondary market. It's, it's not as easy, you know, you've got to start taking into account the laws of the SEC and um, in America and the laws of, the, of ASIC in Australia. That's the, next, that's the next phase. Do you think, do you guys think that that's a, a, a <laughs> suppose, going to occur? I, su I suppose I can talk to this quite, um, quite knowledgeably. So one of my other roles in life, uh, on top of being an investment banker and, and running a crowdfunding platform, 
um, is we also manage the unlisted market. Um, so, Leslie, can you put your pen down? Um, <laughs> um, so, for those of you that are aware, um, for the unlisted market, one of the opportunities we identified to grow that market as part of our exemption, exemption application process was listing crowdfunded companies. Um, we have now got to the point with NB and the FMA that we've agreed the exemption conditions, um, the market rules and a whole lot of disclosure stuff. Um, we are allowed to, or one of the big issues that came up um, and it was a really interesting discussion, was what disclosure do crowdfunded companies need to put into the market before they go into a publicly listed environment? Um, and the biggest issue that um, Anna, from, for who was doing the work with MB, had was what happens if a crowdfunded company takes off? What happens if it raises a bunch of money at a buck a share and the price takes off to 10, 20, $100 a share and they're listed on the unlisted market um, with obviously limited disclosure. Um, the argument we ran on that, which, which um, seemed to go down okay, was we said basically every single investment banker in this country and probably Australia will be climbing all over them along with Tim Bennett from the NZX, trying to get them to transfer up to, to either the NXT market or the main board, which is fantastic. Um, and we're quite happy about that because if we can help companies go from being unlisted to on our market to the NZX, then we've actually done a really good job of growing the capital markets in New Zealand. So for crowdfunded companies to list in New Zealand on our market, they need audited financial statements. And that's it. That's where they got to, um, which from our perspective was obviously quite a relief. Um, from a company's perspective, it's probably not that good because there's a whole bunch of additional cost there. But we had already proposed in our rules that all our companies needed to um, comply with the uh, Financial Reporting Act 2000 and whatever it is uh, and be audited regardless of the number of shareholders. Okay, thanks David. So I think um, let's open it up for questions or statements. Um, if you want to know anything about any of our businesses, I'm going to speak for David and, and for Josh where they're going to tell you open book. So uh, anything you want to know about our crowd, I'm happy to explain as well. So questions. So I've got a couple of questions. The, the first one is, you're talking about the up rounds. You know, yep. this is the positive. Well, what about the negative? So I buy one tenth of one hundredth of one percent of equity. It goes up 25 bucks. And then for something else, it completely crashes. And then I'm your nightmare from hell uh, as an investor because I've now lost money into this. So how is crowdfunding? dealing with that because it's bad enough when I've got 20 or 40 or 50 shareholders uh, who are unhappy about mm -hmm. the, the upside and, and, and the downside um, to this. And, and it kind of goes into the same thing with it, is with the crowdfunding now being that there are going to be multiple up rounds, because um, I've yet to yep. invest in one that didn't have multiple up rounds, to do that. As an investor, am I going to be happy to be dragging a whole bunch of 6,000 people along um, who have put in 25 cents into it while I'm trying to grow my, my business. What's your guys' reaction to that? Uh, well, firstly, uh, this is a risky business. Let's, let's, thankfully, of the 80 investments we've made to date, we haven't had any go sour. We've had one almost on the rocks where we had to do another round to get them going again, and they've come, they've come good. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, whether it was private equity funds of 10 years ago or crowd funds of today, you should have a diversified portfolio. And the first point I'd say is when you say if you've got lots of investors who only own 0.2002% of, of the business, well, these are people who also didn't have the ability to invest 10 years ago into a deal. They now can invest $10,000 and or, or more into any one deal and they get access. But we do tell them you should have a spread. You should have a spread of at least 10 plus, if not more. And, and you saw the statistics, the greater you do, then, and some of them will and potentially could go sour. So you could lose your money. But if you lose your money, we're losing our money. And we may be 30% of the business and we'll lose all our 30%. Okay, so, uh, so. 
so my counter question and counter to that is all the documents that I have to fill out as an investor yep. um, and how much, my, how much I'm worth, understanding my specialties and all the rest of that, I fill up a ton of paperwork because I'm told quite bluntly that the money I put into the organization may, may be lost. Now you're talking about tens of thousands of people that are investing in this, and if I spend my, and this, I'm thinking this from an investor's point of view, not yeah, from yeah, a sure, sure. point of view, but if I'm an investor, do I want to have 25 core investors who have invested maybe upwards of $100,000, $200,000 who are truly there, or do, and do I also want to be dragging along five or 600 other people who are going to continually call up and complain to me that the investment that they've had is, is gone south, even that I've told them up front. I've worked for a lot of organizations yeah. where we've told people this is risky, it's going to fall off. It, it still hasn't stopped the noise. So I guess that's my counterpoint to that. Yeah, and, and, and we do, and, and, and to that point, we do get those investors ringing up asking uh, if a business has gone wrong, why has it gone wrong, and what's going to happen. We, we the, the, the answer that I can give you is that they all sign at the beginning. It's, I'll put it this way, you said, would, you typically would need to go to say, tw is it better to have 25 investors giving 500,000? Absolutely. Is it as easy to do when you're looking at 300 new businesses a month? No, you can't just go and do that every time. Um, but we, as a group, are doing all that due diligence to make sure that we, ca we cater for the ones that go wrong and we can explain it accordingly. And we do. We've got a whole team of people that ask the questions. But the, an the answer is we can't avoid things going wrong and we, and, and we do prefer having a world network of over 20,000, 10,000, 100,000 people and growing who get access to it. So I, 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 can't, I know I'm not answering your question exactly, but I'm trying to give you the sense that we prefer that because we're doing the work for them and they take that on in the beginning and we do know every client who is investing. So I was, uh, I was founding um, director of CropEx Right. So we raised a right. successful round through, uh, through our crowd, yeah. 1.2 million US. That was a fantastic process, but I think the devil's in the detail with a lot of this. Um, uh, the process was excellent, the result was outstanding, but I think our crowd is more of a club funding collaboration yeah. platform than a crowdfunding platform. Exactly right. Um, and so you're sort of mitigating some of the points that you were making, Dave, you know, in terms of risk and exposure, because the people in the club are already orientated towards that sort of threshold of consideration. I think in terms of you know, New Zealand effort, uh, I'm not too sure what the sort of negative sort of sense is out there that you mentioned earlier on. It's relatively early days. We're world leaders with respect to opening up this environment you know, from a regulatory point of view. And I think uh, the real challenge for, for those companies, uh, the platforms in New Zealand, is to educate and manage expectations with a relatively um, you know, new opportunity, a new offering, and exposing risk to folk that typically you know, wouldn't be exposed in the manner that we as you know, experienced angels and in and, and the large uh, community that our crowd has. So that, that again, I think is in line with what, what David's saying. So the jury's out, and, and to me it's going to be uh, how you handle the tears uh, and, and not have the government, <laughs> and not have, have the government overreact you know, as a result of what are going to be a number of catastrophic failures you know, in the crowdfunding space. Uh, we've already experienced that as angel investors. We're used to it, but the general public isn't. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really interesting, and, and, and you know, it's obviously something everyone is conscious of. And um, you know, with uh, my insolvency background, you know, failure is actually, I think failure is good. And, and as a country, we need to embrace failure and say, well done, well, well done for giving an, an honest go. Uh, where there's failure because someone's been dishonest, then, then you know, they obviously should be um, uh, um, being looked after by Her Majesty um, in some ugly building. But look, I think uh, we are going to see some. Uh, we are going to see some knee-jerk reactions. Um, I was at a conference, uh, I think it was earlier in the year, um, and I sat next to a freelance reporter whose name wasn't Leslie Springhill, um, who had invested in Invivo. Um, she, we were talking about crowdfunding. She said, "Oh yeah, I put a thousand bucks into that wine company. What were they called?" Um, 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 and I said, "Invivo." And she went, "Oh yeah." I said, "Why?" And her answer was, "I like the product." 
And you know, I think what we're seeing with a lot of these, these early investors um, is they are investing because they might get a dozen beer a year as a fully imputed dividend or a t-shirt or something and they're investing with the heart and not the head yet. Um, and I think it's going to take a while for that to, to flow through and you know, we're going to need to see some failure for people to actually start understanding some of these issues. And as long as the failure is honest, I hope everyone is accepting and we don't get a witch hunt. Um, whereas if it's dishonest, then you know, my views stand about uh, being a resident of Her Majesty. I, I think what I'll leave us all with is that you know, it's an exciting place to be in this world when you can do a deal in Argentina, get the technology from Nebraska in the United States and have investors in, 400, in you know, 40 different com countries around the world and more importantly, have access to technologies and to businesses that are going to affect your life in a positive way. So I think as Australians and New Zealanders, I think let's all look at the cup half full. All this stuff about crowdfunding and, and angel investing, it's just a way to do it. It's just a means to bring these technologies and bring, bring us into the new world, in, which is a really exciting place. So I think I'll leave it there and say, just on behalf of um, our crowd, thank you very much for having us at, at, the, at this wonderful event, because uh, I only found out about it <laughs> three days ago. And, um, and it, it was actually quite a very quick flight, so I'll be back, but thank you very much. And we're happy to be involved in all your deals and in all your discussions. And if you want to know anything about how our crowd has grown our business or what we're doing and what we're seeing into the future, feel free, it's just a call. It's, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're more than happy to oblige. So thank you very much to everyone here and to all the overseas visitors that have also come. Thanks, Thanks Ashley, really appreciate it.